forward. And I'm going to do the mute all. Sorry, guys. There you go. Owen, you should be able yep. to uh, be on mute. All right, guys. All good. Uh, so we're back uh, for another uh, another night with a distiller, which is uh, always a lot of fun. And um, this will be the second time I've got the chance uh, to uh, sit down and chat with Owen. Uh, for those who didn't know, uh, it was actually uh, Ironclad Distillery, which Owen is from, that was actually one of the distillers that helped trigger my license. Uh, so, uh, so not only did they introduce me to uh, American bourbon on a whole different level, <laughs> they also uh, helped me allow to start dealing with the LCBO and losing hair at a frantic rate. Uh, so, Owen, oh, uh, you know, happy New Year for starters. Welcome to 2021, and uh, yeah, it's it's great to have you on here. So, I'll start with the easy questions. Uh, we'll drink some bourbon. Um, as I said to you, I've got kind of like your full line sitting beside me, so. I'd love you uh, to talk not only about your two core, uh, but then we've got the the hot southern honey, the coffee finish, and the maple finish. Uh, yeah. So for anybody um, who's pouring ironclad but maybe doesn't have uh, one of the uh, the specialty finishers, they'll get a bit of a more of a sense about uh, about it. Um, when I was doing some initial tasting of it, you, I fired you through my my initial <laughs> reviews. I think on uh, on Facebook that one night, and I, I must have been <laughs> I've been enjoying them ever since. So welcome <laughs> officially. But well, welcome, uh, right. nice, happy to be here. Happy New Year's, guys. Yeah. So um, definitely, anybody who has a question, the chat is open. So please, by all means, as we get going, uh, if there's anything that uh, that pops up that you want to ask, go on. Great. Uh, once we get through a little bit. I'll unlock it uh, and we can all kind of like have a nice chat um, as a group and we'll go from there. So Owen, for those who might not be 100% uh, uh, familiar with Ironclad yet, tell us a little bit about uh, the background. You have some really cool stories uh, about your name and uh, you know that shows in, in the small batch label. So start yeah. us off with uh, where you got started. So, hi, my name is Owen King. I'm the head distiller at Ironclad Distillery. Um, it's a uh, distillery we started. I started with my family um, back in 2014. Uh, my dad owns a uh, owns a 30,000 square foot warehouse that was built in 1913, um, and you know he had his other business operating out of there. And uh, he was trying to figure out what we could do to take up the space or use some of the space in this gigantic building. And uh, and so he we we were drinking whiskey one night. He's like, you know what we could do? He's like, we can start a bourbon distillery. And you know after a few bourbons, of course, we're like, oh yeah, let's totally do that. So, you know, I kind of forgot about it for a couple of weeks. I, I walk into work one day and he's like, hey, by the way, I bought a still. And I was like, oh, all right. None of us know how to do that, but let's let's see if we can figure it out. And so down here in the States, I don't, I don't know about in Canada, but uh, you can home brew and home and make all the wine you want in, in America. But uh, you cannot home distill it. It's 100 percent illegal. But we didn't kind of think about that. So uh, we were just like, all right, we got the still. Uh, let's let's see what we can do. And so we we found a farmer, and then we're like, all right, well, we don't want to get knocked out by the ATF. Uh, so let's let's see if we can make this thing legal. So we had this twenty six gallon still, uh, where if we ran it, we would get uh, about five gallons of uh, about forty percent alcohol um, when we ran it. So we need to run it six times uh, to collect five gallons of one hundred and forty proof alcohol. Um, and we're like, oh, great. This is going to be fantastic. We'll make enough, m enough bourbon to, to, you know, supply Virginia. And, uh, and then we're like, oh, uh, that's not going to be enough. Um, we're, we're going to need to make more. And so, uh, we went and bought five more stills, just like the 26 gallon still. And we ended up having a essentially 125 gallon still where we could run it, uh, six times and we'd have five gallons of 160 proof alcohol. And, uh, and so then we eventually like, we got to do something else. This isn't working. And so now we have a 500 gallon combination still where we make about a barrel a day. Um, and, uh, now we, uh, we are officially, you know, able to keep up with somewhat of the demand that we have right now. Um, bourbon is one of those weird businesses that, uh, you actually want to, you want your supply to always outweigh your demand. Um, cause if your supply, if, if your demand is always higher than your supply, you're never going to put out older whiskey. So, uh, we have to kind of, uh, nurture that and make sure that we're always putting away more than we're selling. And so far, 
Um, we're going to have, this is the first year coming in 2021 that we'll actually have a four year age bourbon coming out. That's a bottled and bond. Um, we've also got some other special releases coming out. Um, so I'm super excited to finally be able to release some, some really old stuff and, um, we're putting some more stuff away. That's going to be really exciting. So, um, it's a lot of fun. I was, uh, as, uh, as you were doing a bit of backdrop, I was uh, pouring myself some of the small batch, which yeah. sadly is really starting to get a bit low. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to talk a little bit about it because it actually, this was one of the things that I remember the first time your dad showed me this. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, oh my God, I want this cool. And now, now that I pulled it off, all it's done is triggered my OCD that it won't actually <laughs> stay back on. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit, like talk a little bit about the name because I I remember yeah, so, and I thought it's it was one of the things that you know really drew me to you guys initially. So in 1862, um, it was there was the Civil War was going on, and uh, it was the first. So where our distillery sits uh, was actually where the first naval battle between two ironclad ships took place. Um, it was March 9th, 1862. Um, it was the battle between the USS Virginia or the CSS Virginia, which is a Confederate ship, and the USS Monitor. Um, no other ships ever had ever been uh, uh, fought each other that were ironclad before, and uh, so really this this is the battle that changed history for naval warfare forever. Because at this point, no wooden ship could ever have a chance against a ironclad ship. So after fighting for a bunch of hours, uh, exchanging blows on on cannonballs, uh, both ships ended up calling or uh, just doing a ceasefire and calling it a draw because neither could penetrate each other's hull because they would both had the weapons that could take out a wooden ship really easily, um, but they couldn't handle a ironclad ship. So yeah, so on the one that Brendan has that, oh, we have the USS Monitor on that uh, on that label. And then the one I'm drinking right now, which is our straight, we have the CSS Virginia on here, so. I just can't do that to another label, man. I just won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, we always like to say you get a little history with your whiskey. So instead of getting dumber while you're drinking, you actually get smarter. <laughs> Yeah, it was always just such a fascinating story. Like, uh, even, like you, you can tell that you, uh, your dad had told the story a number of times because I remember him. He almost like set the scene. He's like, imagine the Civil War. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, it could have been it was about three drams into sampling your stuff at the USDA event. But, you know, I, he, he really sold me on it. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like, let's talk a little bit about the different... Um, uh, like the different kind of like products that you actually make. Yeah. Um, so uh, everything you guys have right now um, up in up in Canada um, or on, in Ontario, um, everything you have is our four grain mash bill. Um, so when we first started, I wanted to kind of show off uh, Virginia agriculture um, in that way. In, in that way, I wanted to show you know, use as many grains as possible. And at the time, uh, there weren't a lot of four grains out in the market. Um, you know, I, I see Dan's drinking E.H. Taylor. So a couple of years ago. They had a um, four grain release and it's one of the top five best bourbons I've ever had in my life. Um, and so I wanted to continue with that. Um, and so I was, I was like, all right, let's, let's see what we can do. So our mash bill is 70% corn, 10% wheat, 10% rye, and 10% malted barley. Um, I, the, again, this is just our way of just making sure that you got to try everything that was, that was grown here in Virginia. Um, and so the nice thing about the corn and the wheat, that's, that's where the sweetness is. So when you first sip ironclad, Right up front, you're going to get that nice sweetness in the front. And then as it tails off, you're going to get that black pepper, uh, spicier note in the back. That's where the rye is going to kind of kick in. Malted barley with bourbon, it doesn't actually add any flavor. Um, uh, we only, uh, so it's only in there to convert the starch from the other grains to, sh to sugar. Um, so that's, that's what the malted barley is there for. Ooh. Very cool. So Got our ham and warts. Got to look that up. <laughs> So I had, uh, like, we'll get to, I'll get to drinking some of the specialty uh, finishes shortly, but we did have a question come in. What uh, actually determines kind of like how you're going to go with the specialty bourbon, like bourbons? What is like, obviously you're, you know, <laughs> the other thing that your dad told me was there's this big battle between uh, Kentucky and Virginia of who actually originated bourbon. <laughs> um, and uh, no, definitely, I you know, the small batch has kind of like a very oaky, uh, kind of element to it. The straight bourbon, I, like the first time I cracked that open, I'm like, it, yeah, I would expect that from Kentucky. Uh, yeah. Know, it has that same kind of like sweetness off the nose, but aggression off the back of the palate. Um, but your specialty finishes, they're all over. Like they're all yeah. over the map, literally. 
what uh, <laughs> what's kind of the uh, the origin of um, like I've got the coffee, the maple, and the uh, the hot sundered honey. So you know, there, there's some distillers out there that I, I I mean that are a lot smarter than I am, and you know the, uh, they come up with these ideas, and I and then I'll try it, and I'll be like, oh well, I'd like to do that now. So with the coffee, uh, a bunch of years ago, there's a distillery down here in, in Virginia um, called Ace with Bowman that did a coffee finished bourbon. And I loved it. It was it was spectacular. I mean, it was coffee. It was bourbon. I mean, I don't drink coffee, but it was like all the great parts of coffee that that's the one. Uh, it was all the great parts of coffee that that I love that I wanted to like in coffee without the bitterness. And so I was I asked the distiller, I was like, how did you make this? Like what what went into making this? And he he I mean, he very graciously told me what he did. And he's like, I he's like, I found a coffee roastery that would fill a, a barrel of mine with with coffee beans. They emptied all the coffee beans out. They gave the barrel back to me and I put my aged whiskey back in there. I was like, I could do that. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, so I found a coffee roastery down here in, in Norfolk um, where I live. And um, I was like, hey, I'd like to give you a barrel. I'd like you to fill the coffee beans. And they're like, oh, I was looking for a barrel that I could uh, put coffee beans in. I was like, great. And so uh, I tasted it after one month in the barrel and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is really, really good. Um, but the one thing, the, the thing that's hard about finishes is, is knowing when you want to empty that barrel. So, you know, the, the when you're when you first put the bourbon into a barrel, you're gonna really taste all that that main flavor right up front. Like with the coffee, and one month in, it just tastes like coffee with a little hint of bourbon in the back. Um, so I found like the sweet spot for the coffee is about three to five months in the barrel, where that's where you're you're gonna get that coffee back end in the front end, but it's gonna be bourbon right in the middle. Because if you're gonna drink something, I mean, I, I if it's if it's a if it's a finished bourbon, I want it to still taste like bourbon. So like on our maple syrup finished, um, the, I think the sweet spot for that is about six to eight months. Um, and that one, the reason for that is, is because I, I don't want it to be cloyingly sweet. I, I want that maple back end where you kind of get that really nice maple finish there. Like you're eating like a, you know, stack of pancakes. Um, with the hot honey, this one was, um, I had, uh, I had a, uh, guy that I reached out to that had that was working with honey and I was like hey uh would you take one of my barrels um and put honey in it and he's like yeah he's like but I also have a hot honey um it's made with habaneros um and I'd like to put that one in a barrel as well like I was like I don't think anyone's ever done that I'd like to try that and so uh I had the one honey barrel and I had the one hot honey barrel and I was tasting them as they were going along and the one thing I kept noticing noticing when I tasted the hot honey barrel was every time it finished, you know, that, you, that you're so used to that kind of bourbon uh, burn in the back of your throat as you drink bourbon. I was noticing it was a very different burn I was getting in the back of my throat. And it was actually capsaicin. Um, like I was getting that actual pepper sensation in the back of my throat. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is such a unique experience. And then I gave it to my mixologist at the, at the, at the tasting room. And I was like, what do you think we can make with this? And he, he tasted the bourbon. And he's like, Oh my God, like we're going to make some whiskey sours with this. And it's going to be fantastic. And he did. I mean, it's like the most refreshing drink in the summer um, because it's almost like a spicy margarita. And then in the winter, I always say that if you, uh, if you're ever going to, if you ever feel cold coming on or, or COVID um, you, if you drink a bottle of the hot honey finished bourbon, I promise you, you will not get sick or you won't care that you're sick. One of the two. All right. So, uh, so officially we can all start rolling out uh, our own vaccine then from what I'm hearing. Uh, is uh, just uh, just take a straw to a bit of bourbon and you're and you're good to go. Yeah, I think, exactly. I think the thing that I found like so interesting because I did I you know I was packing <laughs> was packing thing for people uh, one night and I just poured everything out to a whole bunch of glasses and I started going okay let's just go through this and and see what I'm tasting. Um, uh, so if anybody received an empty box, I apologize. Now uh, it uh, it might have been five drams in towards the end of it, but. Um, I think what I loved about the specialty finishes is like, there was always the one that grabbed me immediately. And for me, that was the hot Southern honey. Like I didn't think immediately of a, like a whiskey sour. I thought, you know, it's going to be a damn expensive like wing sauce or rib sauce. Uh, so I'm just saying before the summer and before I have to spend $90 on a bottle to make, to make rib sauce, can you just make <laughs> rib sauce? Um, and, uh, but it was, it had that really nice sweetness up off the head of it. But then, as you said, like I remember, I think it was Will when uh, when we first got it, we sat and and sh and drank our first glass of it, and you did. You're sitting there and you're like, oh, that's kind of got that spice to it, and you expect it to die off, and then we kept drinking, and we're like, oh, it's it's staying with us, <laughs> you know. And you did. You had some very much of a pepper uh, kind of uh, kind of focus to it. Um, 
with the coffee, with the thing that I think caught me off guard is because of the coffee finish. And I'm like, okay, I know what coffee tastes like. And apparently I didn't. Uh, and then I, on my second dram, I went back and I looked at it and kind of said, oh, okay, it's an espresso uh, kind of like bean that they were actually using. And all of a sudden that it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. There's the viscosity of the oil that comes out of the beans. There's kind of that earthy, dark roast uh, kind of thing that you get from espresso. And then the maple finish I found so interesting because I, we had just had like our Canadian, uh, uh, one of our Canadian distillers had just done an order for a maple, uh, maple syrup like cask. Uh, and so I had that profile in, in the back of my head and then I drink yours and I'm like, okay, what is that? And I'm sitting there and it's like, <laughs> I was saying to Renaud this afternoon when we were talking uh, a little bit and uh, I said, you know what? It's almost like going to a maple syrup festival and distilling basically the tree and the maple <laughs> syrup right into it because you do, you have a very woody um, kind of like nuance to it that follows right after the syrup. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really, really cool. Um, well, so the coffee one I think is really unique in the fact that if you do it neat, it's it's straight up coffee and bourbon. If you do it on if you do it over a rock, um, the really cool thing is so they do a really really dark roast, like you know, spread an espresso roast on it. And so when you do it over a rock and the, the the it starts coming down in proof a little bit, it's like a dark chocolate note. It's it's completely different than what what it is when you when you have it. So I always say when it's one thing I always do with people tasting at the distillery. I'm always saying, I was like, here, try it like this. And then I'm going to give you a rock. We're going to try it like that. It's just, it's a completely different flavor that opens up uh, now that those oils have really congealed in there. Nice. So we had a couple of questions uh, uh, pop in. So regarding um, the coffee uh, finish, the question was, did you ever find any bitterness from the coffee barrels? <clears throat> I mean, yeah. So the bitter, I mean, there is, I mean, it's, it's still coffee. So there is, I do still get a nice hint of bitterness in there. I mean, because coffee is bitter. Um, but I, I mean, and the way I, the what I'm always looking for into into it is, is it, is it? I want the more sweeter notes in there of coffee, like that. It's almost like a, a that the, the sugar's been added to the coffee. That's what I've always been looking for. Okay. Uh, and then a question uh, specifically pertaining back to the distilling, because you talked about how you had to ramp up your the size of your stills pretty quickly. The question yeah. was, uh, did you keep your smaller stills, and if you did, what are you using them for? Is it production, <laughs> small batch, or just pure experimentation? So we, we kept one of the six stills. Um, we've only fired it up once since we got the 500 gallon still. Um, we, the one, I, I was originally, keep, we, the reason we kept the one is because we, we thought that we'd eventually do some experiment things like little small one-offs. Um, but the one thing we didn't think about is we actually don't have any way to mash 26 gallons of beer to distill. Um, so when actually, when COVID first hit, we did have, uh, we, were, we were making hand sanitizer and um, we did think about firing up that still to run with the other one so we could kind of have two things running at once, but um, it wasn't uh, necessarily um, monetarily uh, reasonable to run that still. Quite expensive. And how do you find, like, how do you find your processes now? Like, so you've been at this for a while, you guys never thought you were going to open a bourbon distillery, but you know, years from now, here you are. Um, like, what, <laughs> What were you doing before this? Like, what uh, where, what was your background? So, uh, my dad owned a home restoration business, um, which was restoring houses after floods and fires. Um, my degree in college was communication. Um, so, I was originally, you know, in college, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to be a broadcaster when I get out of here, or a radio or a radio personality, something like that. Um, and then, uh, and then I graduated, and I didn't have a job, and my and my dad offered me one. I was like, oh, I. I guess I need one of those now. And so I went down to work for him and I, I had always been, I, I was actually contemplating going to culinary school because um, I, I really, really like to cook. And so uh, my, the, my, the next, so the reason when we started the distillery, we were talking like, who's going to be the distiller. And I was like, well, I, I could give it a shot. I'll, although I never distilled fermented or anything, anything like that before. I was like, let's give it a shot. And uh, so we, tried it and a lot of trial and error and i mean i think right now uh even with try even with doing new things uh different different mash bills and stuff like that um i think we've learned a lot as we go along and we still screw up because that it's inevitable um but uh 
it's it's we've got I think we've got it dialed in pretty well right now, and I'm I'm really happy in where the distillery is going now, especially with the amount of output we're putting out um, per year at the out of our 500 gallon still. Nice. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about it. Like you know, obviously the specialty finishes are one thing. As I said, the straight the straight bourbon definitely has that very that very classic bourbon taste. Yeah. The one thing that I think you know Canadian distilleries. Uh, enjoy is a kind of like freedom there's not really a recipe or a designation of how you have to make something in order for it to be called canadian whiskey it's just the yeah. image of it and everything else is just you know young alt uh or moonshine uh kind of idea but bourbon tends to have that very specific kind of requirement how do you find still trying to be innovative, still doing things that kind of make you passionate and excited to ex explore different things, but know that you are kind of like constrained a little bit with, uh, with the, the way that the whole bourbon process operates. So, you know, bourbon is one of the most strictly uh, um, controlled liquors in the world. Um, you know, we have to be at least 51% corn, made in America, aged in new charred oak barrels, distilled below 160 proof, uh, in the barrel, no higher than 125. You can't add any flavorings or colorings. And lastly, you can't uh, bottle it any lower than 80 proof. So, you know, after looking at all those rules, you're like, okay, what kind of experimentation can I do? But really, there's a lot. And, and I'm always trying to look for something that hasn't been done before. Um, that, you know, that was my idea with the hot honey was like, no one's done this before. Let me, let me see what I can do. Um, uh, so <laughs> this, is, you, this one hasn't started yet, but... Um, the barbecue sauce is currently in the barrel, but I, I gave a barrel to a uh, really good barbecue place down here. And uh, so he said he's going to age his barbecue sauce in the barrel for one year. And I said, when you're done with that, give it back to me because I'm going to do the world's first barbecue sauce finished bourbon. And it might not be good, but it's <laughs> going to be, I'm going to try it because it's, it's got to be, tra I have to try it. <laughs> if not we'll just cook with it <laughs> like five minutes ago to just do the inverse right take yeah. the <laughs> sauce out of it so it should be okay but no yeah so um i mean I, i'm i'm trying to experiment with new with different grains um there's a there's a um so there we're you know we're sitting right on the chesapeake bay in, in virginia and right off the chesapeake bay there's a there's an eastern shore uh peninsula and on that peninsula there's a farm that uh has been there that found this uh, corn grain um, that they can date back. The first time it was grown in Virginia was 1865. Um, and so they've been growing it since then. And um, so we actually had our first ever release of that back in uh, November. And this corn is super sweet. Um, just, I mean, like with yellow field corn that we use for our bourbon, if you were to grind it up and make cornbread with it, You'd have to make, you'd have to add a lot of sugar to it to make it sweet. This cornbread, uh, when we made cornbread, or this corn, when we made cornbread with it, um, we didn't add any sugar to it just because we kind of want to see what the flavor was. It was incredibly sweet. And then when we finally, when we aged it and it came out, it came out super sweet, so much different than what our normal mash bill was um, because the corn was completely different. Um, we've messed around with, uh, with the Bloody Butcher corn, um, which is an all red kernel. Um, I've been looking into getting a uh, triticale, um, which triticale is a hybrid of wheat and rye put together. Um, so I thought that'd be a really cool thing to make our four grain with, except we just do a three grain, um, because it's, it would essentially be the same thing and see how, how the flavor turns out after that. So, uh, I mean, there, there's tons of experiment. I mean, luckily there's a ton of grain out there and a lot of, uh, different ones to try. Um, and so I, I kind of hope that I can keep just doing little experiments like that and have little one-offs here, here and there. So um, I don't burn out from making the same thing over and over again every single day. Oh, we had uh, a suggestion for you to take a look at a, a corn variety. Uh, it's called peaches and cream. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, so it's like a very typical one here, uh, here in harvest season for us. Uh, so there, there might be a way for you to get Canadian into you. Is, uh, there we go. And cream isn't a, isn't a corn variety that's available in Virginia. Um, it's definitely, um, <laughs> yeah, Brent just uh, literally commented it's GMO as a fuck. So, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it's, yeah, it, it it's definitely a sweeter variety. Um, That's cool. Overall, like, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but for peaches and cream, it's just like literally, for me, it's like butter, salt, and pepper, and 
I'm I'm good. I can go through a couple a couple cobs of it, and I'm quite content on a summer evening. So uh, <laughs> that uh, sounds really uh, cool. I have to look that up. And then uh, we had um, another couple questions about some of the uh, the process. So, what sort of barrels have you started to focus on, and what are their specific characteristics that are matching your specific profile or your desired profile? So originally, when we first started, um, we were we were trying to do 15, uh, 15 gallon barrels, thirty gallon barrels, and fifty three gallon barrels. Um, we had a really good cooperage, or we have a really good cooperage in Missouri um, that makes these fifteen gallon barrels for us that we've been using since day one. And that so every small batch barrel you or every small batch bottle you try, it's always out of a fifteen gallon barrel from Missouri. I love the flavor you get out of those barrels. I think they're spectacular and we will continue using them because they do a great job. The straight on the other hand, so the straight for the longest time, um, we've been using 30 gallon barrels that we were getting from South Carolina. Um, up until this year, uh, that cooperage, uh, uh, this, so this year that cooperage went out of business. Um, and at that point we were already considering not using 30 gallon barrels anymore and just specifically focusing on 15s and 53s. And this year also, uh, we had our first cooperage open up in uh, Virginia. Um, it's actually, so it's called Speyside. Um, it's uh, started by Speyside uh, Single Malt um, in Scotland. Um, and so they have a cooperage in Ohio and they have a cooperage in, uh, in Virginia now. And so now we're specifically focusing on 15s and, uh, and 53s uh, just because one, when I want to when I want to go sell a 30 gallon barrel after I'm done with it, it's very difficult because it's a weird size and no one really deals with 30 gallon barrels. And on top of that, we really have enough stock in 30 gallon barrels that uh, we can by the time we empty our last 30 gallon barrel, uh, our 53s will be at about three to four years. Our, all of our 53s will be at th about three to four years old, which I'm very happy the flavor they they're putting out um, at that age. Um, so that's kind of what we're focusing on right now and. Uh, yeah, so last year we filled, um, I believe it was 60 53 gallon barrels. So um, very excited about uh, in about three or four years then to see how those all turn out. So another question about uh, pertaining a little bit more to the um, special, specialty finishes. With all the experimentation that you guys have done, is there anything that you've just said no? And you've had to like dump it. <laughs> like I said, well, the 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 bear, the, uh, the barbecue sauce one might be the first, but uh, so far, no. Um, uh, no, everything's turned out so far. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of was uh, happy with everything we've kind of experimented with, experimented with, and I mean the the one honey barrel that we did like there was not hot honey we ended up blending that with the hot honey because we liked it so much we liked it so much more with the hot than we did the regular so um we ended up doing that that was that was i mean if that would be the closest thing that we did came to doing it well we'll see what happens with the barbecue sauce then i guess uh, that'll be, that'll be the <laughs> yeah, we'll find out it's like, come on uh, <laughs> so uh, like you know one of the things that i think you know in addition to the story, in addition to, to being able to sample a whole bunch of stuff when you guys were up north for USDA, um, I think one of the things that's really set you guys apart as well, and you kind of tout it, you're like, we do bourbon. That's what we do. <laughs> that's it. You know? Um, and I mean, a lot of distilleries out there, and nothing against them, like, but a lot of distilleries usually start off in something that they can take right out and bottle and uh with so it usually starts with like a gin or a vodka and then they're kind of like backfilling their revenue so that they could eventually get into a whiskey or or getting into a barrel aged gin or whatever the case may be yeah um, well, i can tell you the uh it's not the choice <laughs> it's not the best idea for a business model to wait a, uh, you know about a year and a half to start making money um and you have to put out a lot of money in that amount of time um, but luckily it worked for us. Uh, and that, that kind of gives us, I mean, I, I, I always think in this industry that there has, you have to find something that can separate yourself from the rest of the pack. Because uh, if you're just doing, I mean, you're, if you're making bourbon and it's good, there are tons of other distilleries out there that are making bourbon that's also good. So what are you doing that's going to separate yourself? That's that you're going to, what are you doing that someone else isn't doing? And there aren't many distilleries out there that are focused on one thing. Um, of only making bourbon. So uh, that was what we really want to stick to our guns. Plus, we really like bourbon. So like, why why make something else? Fair. So 
like uh, most bourbon drinkers or most whiskey drinkers, I think, you know, as you can tell from some of the collections uh, floating around in some of the backdrops here, um, we all kind of have our favorites. We all kind of have, you know, obviously, I would say as a distiller, you probably say, well, I, I enjoy our stuff the most, you know, I think that's the, uh, that's the marketing message that usually gets walked out the door. Um, <laughs> But what's like what's on your shelf like what do you enjoy uh when you're not uh, pouring your special uh your special bottles from the bottom of the barrels well i i mean i'm sure you guys have four roses up there but i don't know if you guys get the four roses uh single barrel barrel strength releases um but those are my absolute favorite so um the the thing that i this, this is where you kind of can nerd out here um so four roses has two mash bills uh they have one that is 15 percent rye and they have one that's 25 or 35 or 25 or 30% rye. I can't remember what it is. Um, but then they have five different yeast strains. Um, so they have one yeast strain that's fruity, one that's uh, floral, one that's uh, spicy, one that's something else and the other and something else. And so in total, now they have 10 different recipes because they have two, two mash bills, five different yeast strains, two times five, 10. Um, they're spectacular. Um, every single one of them is different and it really speaks to the fact of how yeast can really make a huge difference um, in your bourbon. Um, so I've actually I'm kind of piggybacking off them. I've started experimenting with some different yeast. There's a really good distillery in Kentucky that has started culturing um, different dry yeast that you can make. Um, and, they, and they've given you like the flavor profiles you're going to get off that yeast strain. Um, so it's really kind of cool to uh, nerd out about that and like kind of really focus on um, trying something different that, so you can, you can make the same thing, but have a different fl flavor profile, um, of the same thing you normally make them with that, they, that that's your everyday bourbon. Um, besides that, I mean, I, I love Four Roses. I can go on for hours about Four Roses. Um, I don't know if you guys get Willet up there. Um, Willet is, uh, in, it's, it's in Bardstown. Um, it's one of the most sought after bourbons. So it, it, to get a bottle of it is always something special. Um, they are they're spectacular uh it's a family-owned distillery just like us um they started by sourcing um when they, when they when they restarted it's actually a pretty old distillery it starts it started back in 1908 um when they restarted the brand back in 2008 i believe um they had to source a bunch of stuff and they sourced it from all over the the country um and then uh now they're back to the, everything they're doing now is off is off their own uh still and aged by them um, they do a pretty spectacular job. Nice. So, but of course, ironclad. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, uh, we were talking a little bit about it before uh, before the call. Um, Ontario is now in like its second lockdown. Uh, I collectively heard this afternoon a whole bunch of parents from across the province all week as they found out their kids aren't going back to school for another couple of weeks. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. So uh, yay. Um, but uh, how uh, like how has the pandemic kind of like affected you, if at all, and like what well, is it like to kind of be a manufacturer through this? You know, when when we first got hit, um, and and when we had our first shot, our, our only shut down, which was back in March. Uh, we got hit and, you know, we were like, oh God, what are we going to do? And then they came out and said, there's a, uh, there's a hand sanitizer shortage um, in distilleries. We're going to, the FDA said that we can uh, start making it, no penalty. So we're like, okay, great. Um, so we ended up doing about a thousand gallons um, or 1200 gallons of hand sanitizer that, that we sold out and donated a bunch. And that was great. I mean, that was a super helpful to uh, keep everyone employed um, and really help us through uh, the two and a half months that we were we were closed. And um, and then, you know, then we were able to open back up and, you know, still had COVID, still had a pandemic. But now we had to worry about a uh, presidential election. And so I kept saying, um, you know, put a pandemic in a presidential election in the same year, people drink a lot. And that, that was proven at the distillery um, that people were willing and ready to drink a lot. And uh, they'd go anywhere they could get it. And since we, so in Virginia, we have ABC stores kind of like, uh, like the LCBO. Um, and so we were, we were uh, deemed essential because, um, uh, you know, if alcoholics couldn't get alcohol, then they'd, they'd flood the uh, healthcare system. Um, so, yeah, we uh, we ended up being a stay open the entire time, um, just uh, for bottle sales, and it was uh, it was really good doing both those things. So, 
Yeah, 2020, uh, people complain about it a lot, but at least for the business, it was a really good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like uh, we had a, a very similar, it was interesting to see the collaborations that you started to see out of the Ontario distilleries as they all were kind of like, well, I can produce this much or I have access to this component of the process of making, oh, yeah. uh, uh, of making the hand sanitizer. And, uh, you know, I hope for your sake, like the one thing that I think um, distilleries across Canada have run into now is there was a similar demand. There was like, well, we don't have enough hand sanitizer. Let's open it up to the distilleries uh, to, to help us out. And similar to yourself, you know, a whole bunch of them pivoted to kind of say, we'll, we'll, we'll stand up and we'll do what's required to help the frontline workers and everything like that. The backlash on the backhand of it is now there's a whole bunch of them that have all this inventory because they were churning it out as fast as they can. And then, you know, Johnson and Johnson and all the other uh, big wigs, they caught up. Yeah. And, and, and the feds just kind of said, well, thank you very much. And they walked away. Uh, and, uh, you know, so all of a sudden they weren't allowed to sell anymore, um, but they've now got all this inventory. So it was a bit of a backhanded slap, uh, at least for up here. I'm not sure if, if it was a similar situation down <clears throat> south or. No, we, we had a similar thing. So right before the new year or yeah, it must've been right. It was, must've been December 31st. Uh, the the food food and drug administration um, sent out a whole bunch of bills to every distillery that made hand sanitizer for fourteen thousand dollars. Wow! And so no one expected that because no, they told us that we were tax exempt or not tax exempt, but we were able to make it freely under no penalty and everything like that. And um, and so you know after everyone, so every distillery got to that got together, and uh, I mean people got really upset about this. And um, and they the the uh, health service or not it, it was the HHS which is something um, they ended up pulling it and saying okay sorry you don't have to pay that fourteen thousand um, dollars we will rescind that uh, so it was really I mean like it was it was a scary like three hours where everyone thought they were going to get a bill for fourteen thousand dollars and then we didn't um, yeah I mean the hand sanitizer dri dried up relatively quickly I mean it was about a month and a half to two months of sales and then it dried up i mean we still have roughly 250 gallons left um which in the grand scheme of things isn't that much um uh, it was it, it was relatively cheap to make um so and i and so that's fine i mean it, it's uh it, it was i mean in the meantime when we were able to make it and sell it and donate it uh, it was needed, and um, we were really lucky that uh, we were able to help, and then also kept our business afloat. So um, we can't complain. <laughs> Worked out okay. Good stuff. No, it's always great to hear. Like it was, it was, you know, bad blood aside for our federal government and the distilleries uh, up here. Um, it was really incredible to see, and I think we saw things across across the UK, across America. It was incredible to see the entire industry rally behind it so quickly. It felt like it was, uh, you know, all of a sudden, like for us, there's one, um, uh, what, maybe 45 minutes from here that just said, screw it, we've got to do it. Like, and they were kind of like one of the first ones to kind of push, um, I think the government to realize that the distilleries could help. Yeah. And they kind of took the risk immediately of saying, this might backfire, we might get charged uh, for it, but the healthcare industry needed the support and uh, you know following that it was like just a flurry of of uh, support from the industry so uh, yeah I think I think many of us I've still got from one of our distilleries out west I've got uh, some alchemist uh, distiller hand sanitizer in my car so I'm, I was I was nervous driving around anywhere around the Christmas season you know get a pulled over for one of those you know um, safety checks and they roll down the window, and all they're gonna smell is like alcohol. It's like have you been drinking? I'm like, no, I swear it's my hands. Like, but uh, anyway. no, I have that I have that same constant fear every time I drive home from the distillery because I'm like, I know I smell like alcohol. There's and there's no way I'm gonna be able to convince that I'm like, no, I work at a distillery. Yeah. So what I'd like to do with this, I won't pepper you with too many more questions, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to open it up to everybody else. Uh, so I will unmute uh, everybody or ask everybody to unmute. And um, yeah, it's just kind of a free for all at this point. Um, but Owen, uh, you know, 
as we were talking about when you first signed on, you were like not only one of the first distilleries to, uh, to trigger my license, which I'm eternally grateful for, but uh, you were also one of the first ones that sat down on a chat with me. So it's been, it's been such a pleasure to catch up. Uh, again. Oh, it's really great. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, uh, open mic now, guys. So uh, you've all probably had at least a dram and a half. Uh, so uh, any questions to fire at Owen? <laughs> okay, Daniel's ahead of us. <laughs> but uh, go for it. I have a quick okay, question. I got a question. Oh, Jeff first. Okay. Sorry, uh, I was I was given a recipe from a uh, a work colleague uh, out of uh, the UK, uh, and what it was was uh, essentially to take some bourbon, add it, in, uh, pour it into a uh, a jar with some pecans, and then pour it like out, leave it for a week, and then pour the uh, bourbon back into a jar and enjoy the bourbon. Yeah, uh, but also take those pecans and roast them and, and have a, a nice recipe snack kind of thing. <laughs> so the, the bourbon itself with that pecan flavoring was, it, it actually really enhanced the bourbon. And, and I was just wondering in the distillery mode, are you allowed to add things like nuts or uh, like pecans into the barrel to enhance flavors that way? So no, um, we can't. So with bourbon, we're not allowed to add any flavoring additives, which pecans or pecans would be that. Um, <clears throat> uh, but no, it's it's that's kind of funny. You just said you said that because uh, just this today, I made a pecan infused bourbon cocktail. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that actually just did happen. It was it was, the, the the bourbon was fantastic. I I had never done that before. Um, but yeah, so if, so if we did do that, we just have to call it whiskey. Um, we couldn't put the name bourbon in front of it. Um, and we would just be a pecan flavored whiskey. Thank you. Has that, has that ever mm -hmm. been something that you've considered? No, uh, I, I mean, I think, I mean, I think flavored whiskeys, there's definitely a place for them. And I think they do is there people who do them do a great job. Um, I, I, I kind of like the finishing idea better. Like I was, I have a, a friend who has a pecan farm down in New Mexico and I was trying to figure out some way I could do a pecan finished bourbon, but I just don't think there's enough oils in the pecans that would leach into the barrel that would, and then, I could, and then getting the pecans back out would also be a pain. So it's, I actually have considered it, just couldn't, I just couldn't make it feasible. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, yep, next question. Um, I know there's a drastic difference between the environment for aging in barrels and in particularly in the southern states you guys are kind of midway in that so where are you storing your barrels and how are you managing that so you know if you're in texas where you can go 10 or 14 days in a row where it's over 100 degrees and it never gets below 100 degrees yeah you've got a serious problem because the bourbon's never going to come back out of the wood so we have the four seasons here in virginia um especially where we are at um, like right now it's, it's 40 degrees outside, which is great. Um, in the summer we'll hit a hundred during the day, but then it'll cool down to the seventies or eighties at night. Um, so we have those constant temperature changes that you want to see in bourbon. Um, we have, so all our bourbon stored in our, in our, uh, warehouse where we're, where we're at. Um, so we have some barrels on the first floor right by right next to the distillery. And then there's some barrels up on the third floor, um, where that, that, where that's the majority of where the barrels are. So I, what I've noticed is the barrels up on the third floor where it maintains a much higher temperature uh, for majority for longer in the in a year. Um, I've noticed those barrels come out a little better. Um, I, I kind of prefer those. Um, uh, but the ones down the first floor with because since they're sitting right next to the distillery in the winter months, they get a little or they get a little bit more heat than what the uh, ones upstairs on the third floor do. <laughs> yep, it's right there. there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. <laughs> well, you're right. You're right on the bay, so yeah, yeah. So, so my, my brother was stationed at uh, the Norfolk uh, facility. He was in the, the the Navy, and he was at yeah. the he had a NATO secondment. So we went to visit him one November, about five or ten years back now. Uh, but we went in November, and the, the the temperature was around 60 to 62 degrees. So yeah. us Canadians, we're out there in our short sleeves walking on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, no. So the, the funny thing about bourbon is, so um, with a with a barrel, uh, anything below fifty degrees, there's nothing happening in the barrel. So the bourbon is just sitting there. It's not in the staves. It's not out of the staves. It's just it's just sitting there. Nothing's happening in the barrel. So ideally, I don't like it to drop below fifty degrees in the in the taste in the barrel rooms. Which if you ever go, if you guys ever go to Kentucky or if you guys have ever been to Kentucky. Um, you'll go into those rick houses and you'll notice every single rick house will have these radiators sitting in all the corners. And those radiators are there specifically to make sure that if the temperature drops below 50 degrees, they'll kick on and they'll heat up in there to make sure that those barrels always stay above 50 degrees. So mostly I don't have those. I just pray it doesn't get below 50 degrees <laughs> for all that long. I install those. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> So not being a uh, bourbon drinker myself, per se, I prefer whiskeys. Um, what's the, again, not knowing the history or, or the method, what's the minimum amount of time that your bourbon has to be in its barrels to be called a bourbon? So if you put bourbon into a new charred oak barrel and took it out two minutes later, you can call it bourbon. <laughs> uh, for it to be straight bourbon, it has to be minimum two years. Uh, so the... Um, the thing about, you know, it, so now once I put, if I were to put the bourbon in the barrel and put it even in there for two minutes and dump it back out, I'd never be able to use that bourbon, uh, that barrel again to make bourbon because it has to be new charred oak. Um, so that is the, you know, the one rule, but there's no minimum age for bourbon. Um, so we do have, we have the two year for straight and then we have the four year for bottled and bond. Um, and bottled and bond was the, was the first ever food and drug act um, set up by a government to say like what is what that what's in this is what's in that but it was certified by the by the federal government saying that this is bourbon um it's not you know something that's going to kill you that was 1897 i believe hey thank you it was actually so i can see on dan's on dan on dan's uh he's drinking the colonel e.h taylor so it was actually colonel e.h taylor who was the one who came up with the bottled and bond act um so everything he does is 100 proof bottled and bond and uh, actually, that's something I wanted to discuss as well, because bottle and bond, it's, it's coming up more and more. And uh, one that popped up for me this year during COVID was uh, Master's Keep from Wild Turkey. Oh, yeah. Uh, because they released a 17-year-old, just the standard batch, which was their first release. Yeah. And their second release, suddenly there's bottled and bond. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so is my first one kind of like you cheated somehow or <laughs> so most likely what I think what I think with the 17 year release, I believe it was like 92 proof or 86. I, I think it was a little low. Uh, with the bottom bond, it means it has to be at least 100 proof. Okay. And I and so that was probably what it was, because I, I know that some of those sometimes those master keeps, they're a little lower in proof. And I think that's why they put they just slapped on bottle and bond on it because it was a, they made sure it was a hundred proof. I've got four of the five. I'm still missing the decades, but I'm working. Oh, on it. De the decades is really good too. Love me some turkey. I've got to find it. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's one of the things uh, in Ontario we starve for good bourbon. Yep. Uh, the LCBO, unfortunately, in the recent years, especially, like, I, I still remember I found my first Blanton's Gold. When I was still living with my parents in a little, like in the county here uh, where I live, and the tiniest little liquor store, like I swear to God, it's probably about the size of my shop here that I'm in, and uh, there just happened to be this one bottle sitting on the shelf, and I was like, oh, this is neat. It has a little horse on top. I was like, oh, this is a cute little bottle. I don't even think it had the box at the time, and I was just like, you know what, hundred bucks. Why not? I was making tip money at the time. I was like, tax free. I'll buy it. <laughs> now you can't find them for under like 225 roughly. Yeah. And I still got the empty bottle in my cellar. <laughs> I still kept it. And it's funny because now I'm trying to collect all the letters. Yeah. It's <laughs> playing to my advantage. But <laughs> we're still starving for good bourbon. And the way the LCBO works now, everything going through allocation um and when good things do come down the pipeline and they end up in the stores they end up in toronto so anybody that's not there kind of gets screwed so for us to be able to bring in 
uh, bourbons directly that the LCBO never sees. And it's a fair allocation because we talk to Brendan, we, we place our order and uh, we're able to maybe reorder if we're lucky enough. Uh, <laughs> batches are big enough. So it's, it's nice to have somebody that's dedicated to bourbon, to have that, uh, that direct source and not have to deal with the LCBO in the same sense that we have to for all the other stuff. And Brandon still gets to deal with the shit end of the stick and uh, <laughs> deal with the bureaucracy of uh, couriers and and uh, pickups and drop offs and all that jazz. But it, well, it's great to have somebody like you on board. More to, Thank more you. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm sure up there you got I'm sure you guys have bourbon groups up there that sell and trade bourbon as well, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, of course you're going to pay secondary prices, which are always uh, like astronomical and okay. very hard to justify, but sometimes you get lucky. What would you pay for a Weller full proof? Uh, I paid $50 for one. Yeah. It's 500 <laughs> minimum. Really? Yeah. yeah. I just bought one for five fifty. Oh my like gosh. Store pick. It's uh, like, it's, if it's I'm almost like the drive down to the United States. That's what it's all. <laughs> yeah. So Virginia's Virginia's kind of funny. Like like I said. So you know we have we have a ABC store here. Um, so it, it, so in Virginia the allocations that they use, what they used to do is they used to do a lottery and the lottery was horrible. Um, I never won. Um, my sister seemed to always win, which I always got the bottle, so it worked out well. But. Um, yeah, so the first time this year, they decided like, all right, so, you know, there's a pandemic. Let's go have people wait outside stores. Uh, we'll say what's at each store and you can go wait outside and get one. And so, uh, yeah, they, they put out Weller Foolproof, Elijah Craig 18, the uh, E.H. E. Taylor Single Barrel and the E.H. Taylor Barrel Strength, or Barrel Proof. And uh, so I went and stood in line um, and I got a Weller Foolproof for $50. And then my wife stood in line and got the E.H. Taylor for 60 so our 70. So the really cool thing is since, since we're, since it's state run down here, um, everything is MSRP. Um, so you never have to pay, worry about secondary prices. So like, that's really nice. But again, it's, you're limited on, I mean, it's, if you're not there when the truck arrives, you're not going to get a Blanton's or a Buffalo Trace or, um, you know, things like that, that some people take for granted. Um, and, um, and that's okay. I mean, luckily I own a bourbon distillery and uh and if, if times get hard uh i don't have a lack of uh alcohol <laughs> that was, I as, you, as you've seen earlier <laughs> yeah that was pretty sweet that was one of the best bunkers i've seen in a while it's it's definitely proven to be one of the challenges like i mean i can even i can even remember talking to your dad about it. he's like should i be looking at retail uh you know when we were talking about it here and it's just like let's just get you into the province to start let's get people enjoying it uh because i remember he was talking to somebody from the lcbo i believe and uh <laughs> i think he he must have almost had a minor stroke when he he found out how much like how much of your own profit you would have had to like slice off <laughs> to, to get into the retail um and uh yeah it's interesting like i mean you know will and i both can attest you know for a few distillers who have said, you know, let's let's take a wild swing at it. Let's go for a submission uh, and see if we can go for retail. Uh, it's definitely something that we can do. Um, but boy, uh, the last one that we ran was for a gin, and it gives you, I mean, it, it gives you an idea of the scale of the LCBO when they said the only reason that we weren't moved forward was because they had 300 other gins that came in for that one submission. Um, and, you know, to Daniel's point though, the ridiculous component of it all is, okay, so you had, you had 300 gins that you don't currently stock that no one can get, but you're letting in one? Like, <laughs> it, it seems so asinine uh, and backwards. Um, and it's interesting, uh, I think Tom, you shared it onto uh onto one of the groups i saw it on the owls group as well um there's a with the pandemic it's really pushing um pressure from both the hospitality industry towards the lcbo and now the consumers uh towards the lcbo of saying come on like 
you've got to give us something. Um, so it's, it, it'll be really interesting. You know, I think everybody on this group, myself included as, as a person in this industry would be thrilled if there would be a way to have, I would even say halfway in between government run and free market. Like I just want specialty sh uh, shops. Yes. Um, that would be what I would love because right now what I'm doing is I've navigated their models enough to set up a let's call it a virtual specialty shop that sticks within their rules and regulations. However, if I tried to do this as a brick and mortar, like, you know, clap me in irons, you guys wouldn't see me again. <laughs> like, it's, uh, and it's really a shame uh, to Daniel's point, And I think everybody on here, you know, there's a demand for unique product. Um, and it's just, it's such a shame when, you know, the LCBO only, nothing against like Buffalo Trace, nothing against Bullet, nothing against any of the ones that are, are carried on mass. But if you want one, you've got one. Um, and if you're looking for something else up here, you're kind of out of luck unless you're going to the secondary market. You say, yeah. you know, but with Buffalo Trace, there's so many products that they produce mm -hmm. that you cannot touch. Like they're, they're, I think there's seven lanterns out there. And I've only ever seen three on the market in Ontario. Well, there, I mean, there's the, yeah, that's, I mean, that's true, but there's, there's some that are unique to Japan and there's some that are unique to Europe. Um, and so it was up until, I mean, since the, I mean, the, the other ones that you don't have are the ones you don't want. Uh, there's the, cause they're all 80 proof and it's like, no one wants a Blanton's that's 80 proof. It's already bad. It's I, I, in my opinion, it's not my favorite at 93 proof. Depends on the price you're paying for them. If you're <laughs> then it's not worth it if you're yeah. because I'm interested in this and I want to try it at 40 proof. Yeah. It's not so bad. Cause even with my, my barrel, uh, um, barrel proof stuff, I tend to add a little bit of water over time, you know, just add a little straw, half straw, oh, yeah. half straw full and just see how it develops the, the, the profile over time. But it's still an exploration factor. So you still want to try all of them at some point. <laughs> So like guys post uh, black bottles all the time of lanterns and you're like, oh, well, I'd love to try it, but not at $500 a pop. <laughs> so Very true. It, it's, a, it's a give and take. There's, there's a lot of product out there that I'd love to try. But when GTS comes on the market or Eagle Rare 17, uh, Will It, um the wlw it, it i'm sorry but i'm not paying a grand a pop <laughs> no, no. guys somebody just posted they got a box of uh three bottles each uh gts uh eagle rare 17 and i think thomas hardy handy oh, wow. and they got e every bottle for 115 bucks at their local grocery <laughs> That's a dream. It's unbelievable. The guy said there should be a documentary made about this because they <laughs> and he said, I am drinking all of them. None of them are for sale or I'm going to hand them down to my, my sons. <laughs> like, don't offer me. And the first thing that people do, oh, I'll give you 300 bucks for a bottle and I'll post a video of me opening it. It's like, <laughs> shut up. The guy said he's not selling. He's not shipping. Don't deal with that. But that's what you're going to deal with in the secondary market because guys are desperate, even in the States. I get it that we're stuck on allocation and the LCBO is basically our master when it comes to the, the antique line, when it comes to Buffalo Trace. But guys in the States are even suffering. And, and depending on what state you're in, you have no allocation. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of little stores now that are saying, basically, screw you to Buffalo Trace. Because you don't get the good bottles unless you sell a whole sh crap ton of crappy bottles. Like, yep. you want the fireball to move out the door before you get the Buffalo Trace antique line. Now, I, my, I have a friend who has a really funny story. So my friend grew up in New Jersey. And uh, so there was this liquor store down by the shore. And this liquor store could not keep fireball on the shelf. And so like during the, during the summer, they just sell cases and cases and cases of fireball because it was the summer. Everyone wanted to drink, get, drink, get, get, just, 
get drunk and drink fireball. How horrible that was. And um, so when he came down to fall, uh, their Buffalo Trace uh, rep came out to him and handed him uh, a case of Pappy 23 and uh, Pappy 20 and all that. And uh, he goes, here you go. And the guy, go, he, the guy sold them all at, at cost because he didn't know what they were. <laughs> and, oh, so, <laughs> and so like i mean I, I guess it happens now every year and now he doesn't now like now the guy's caught on but like how amazing would that be to walk into a store and be like oh my god i can get pappy 23 for 230 dollars like oh you could yeah. turn around and sell that and pay your mortgage and it still happens that's, so that's, you, uh, there are still you, stores out there that do it have you enjoyed it yourself then uh owen uh, I've only had up to 50, uh, Pappy 15. Uh, I've never had the 20 or 23. On my, uh, on my wedding day, I had the Lot B, the, fam- the Van Winkle Family Reserve, that my groomsmen and I uh, drank before I got married. So that was a lot of fun. I've heard they're not worth it. They're not worth secondary. No. You're just uh, overhyped kind of. It's another supply and demand issue, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a thing that uh, that Buffalo Trace says every year. They've already made all the pappy they're going to make for 2050. Like, <laughs> like they can't make any more for that year. Uh, so it, it's just like that. That's it. They're not going to. I mean, they only have all the pappy 23 they're going to make. It takes 23 years to make. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's if you can get it for retail, 100 percent it's worth it. But is it worth two thousand, three thousand dollars? I mean, if you have it, if you want to spend that much, I guess. So what? Uh, what from your line, like uh, you know, Russ, you were talking about it. Uh, for example, you're you consider yourself to be a, like a whiskey. So I know you're enjoying the two brewer stuff quite a lot these days. Um, from your line, Owen, what would you say for somebody who's coming from Scotch or uh, Irish whiskey or whatever the case may be? Where would you start them in the line? I would still start them at our small batch. Um, I think that there are some European, um, some European notes to our small batch. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have like the peatiness or smokiness to it, but it's softer on the barrel um, than what a, what an older bourbon is going to have. So you're not going to get that necessarily, you know, punch in the back of your throat that maybe the straight would give you. Um, but yeah, like I, so people who come into the distillery and they're like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big Scotch drinker. What, like, what do you have? I, I always give them our small batch first, just because I'm like, this will have a more Jameson quality to it than it would to, than it would, you know, our regular, uh, than any regular, you know, Jim Beam uh, would have uh, that, that, that they might be expecting. I, I find your small batch very Canadian like in flavor. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it does have a, it, it doesn't have a very, overly bourbon quality to it. I think there's some European whiskey quality to it. What, what's your percent of rye in the mash bill? 10%. 10. So that's why you get that little, you know, black pepper nut in the back. Renaud, I know you were, uh, you were the first person to actually uh, uh, review yes. a small batch uh, for us. And I remember you kind of calling it almost like the peat. Uh, yep, the peat there it is. Bourbon. Nice. Um, <laughs> and yeah, you kind of you likened the oak presence of it to peat. Uh, yeah, I I, 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 I I termed it yeah like an oak head because the oak presence was was um, very present, not dominate, uh, not dominating or or, or or overpowering, but it had a very uh, like to me it is a, a very good focal point. So I called you said if you, you know call me an oak head because the the oak was very was 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 present but it again it was it added a lot and it was a an, an anchor of flavor to to what you you had and it's like oh i, I just loved it when i first had it it's just like okay what's this and then i had it again and again it's just like damn it this is good i really really enjoyed it because it was a different way of presenting now uh granted it's not a spray bourbon but still um, it was presenting a, a little more experimentation in the bourbon flavor that it wasn't just the, your, your typical, uh, and, 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 and not to, to slag the other names because I mean, they're, you know, they're all good for, you know, you like what you like, but yeah. that it was, you, you painted outside the lines. 
mm-hmm. and, and delivered something that says, okay, you know, this is it, it, that it, because un- unfortunately sometimes, you know, you don't want to get painted in that, like, well, all birds, all bourbons are this and all, all scotches are this and all this. And what I liked about it was that, okay, uh, it, this, this, it, it gave me, you know, a, a bourbon profile, but it gave me something that was different and out of the norm that is like, okay, you know what, if I'm in the mood, I want to try something different and I want to get saying, okay, I know what you like about bourbon, but I I want you to try something a little different. I want you to go outside you expect and try this. And I, and, and now mind you, we have COVID, so we can't have people inside the house. (laughs) So more for me. So that's good. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, but it, what I liked about it is that it's, it's not just, Oh, okay. It's a nice bourbon. It's just like, no, there's, there's something really unique and different and, 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 uh, and, and, and bold and, and, uh, experimental about it that says and i like the uh, the alcohol uh, you know the 90 proof so it's like okay a little bit more more uh uh heft to it but not overpowering so it's like oh this is and uh it it, it what what's interesting about it is that um the, and, and the stories because we always talk about you know being in advertising you like the stories but it's the stories not just behind the name but behind the brand and the whole thing and the label it's just like this is smart from right from the get go. So I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, know? you very much. Much appreciated. So, That's what I'm drinking. Of... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. That's go what ahead, I'm Tom. drinking tonight. And I think what uh, Renault was talking about the oakiness, it's the, the, the smaller barrel, the 15 gallon yeah. barrel. And yeah. I don't think you want to age it much past two years. <laughs> no. <laughs> or <if you> get <laughs> over oaked. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think the sweet spot on those 15s is about 14 to 16 months. Um, we've, I, I, I've had 15 gallon barrels go as long as three years. Um, and yeah, there's a point where it's like, eh, this is, this is getting a little like, uh, like I'm chewing on an oak tree here. Yeah. This, uh, this little... has a nice, subtle, smoky char to it. Yeah. yeah. And well, thank uh, you very much. And, and it, what's, what's good about it is that, you know, cause you, you, you know, uh, with that, uh, you know, young whiskeys can be bold and brash and exuberant, but, um, I, I think this one, though, it, while it, you know that it is tempered, it's still—I don't want to say it's polite, but it's still—it's—it's not—it's not raw. It's still fairly polished for for what you have, considering the size of the cask you use. So it's not just—it's not aggressive and angry and in your face, but it has a lot of—it has a lot of depth to it for its age. Thank you. So that's a—you're saying so it's a preteen, not a full teenager. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 Careful, careful. <laughs> we stay above the age limit. We're fine. <laughs> no, Will, I remember you talking about it as well because, you know, like I think it was one of the, would it have been one of the early bourbons that you really, like I know it was one of the earlier ones that you and I worked uh, on and um, I think it was the first bottle specifically through quarterly that you had got. Um, I think, I think, I, know I think it was the Scotch lover, although you're getting there. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember you commenting on the profile as well. I think it was our, our second one. I think uh, that broken top came in first mm-hmm. and that was that milder, nice drinking whiskey bourbon, um, similar to a lot of the Canadians that I'd had and some of the scotches that I enjoyed and uh definitely the ironclad the first thing that hit me was the oak it was that whoa what is this it was completely different than anything that i had had and um i'm finding and you can see it's not a bottle i've shied away from that uh (laughs) it's it that oakiness doesn't hit as hard anymore um i don't know whether it's because the bottle's been open a little longer or my taste buds have now become more accustomed same as i'm doing with pete that i don't mind it as much um, I do get that nice charred flavor from it, which I, I do enjoy. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great, been a great drink and, uh, I'm really enjoying straight as well. So thank you very much. What, what batch are you up to on the small batch now? 58. We just did 58 yesterday. Brendan, we're overdue. This was 47. <laughs> <laughs> well, Your necker fell off, Brendan. Because a couple of us are getting kind of low. <laughs> so, how much of a difference do you see from batch to batch? I mean, ideally, I want them to be similar but different. So, like, you know, every barrel's different. So, 
we have a reservoir that we never let go empty. We always leave about three to four inches of, of bourbon left in there. Um, Cause I want a consistency of flavor, but I want there to be subtle differences between each, each batch. Um, I always think the ones that are bottled in summer might be a little bit better than the winter ones. Cause uh, I think you get the, I think the oakiness is a little bit more present cause there's so much more bourbon left in the staves. Um, but I think the winter ones, they tend to be a little softer um, in the, in the oaky notes, which is fine. Just my, my flavor profile. I, I like the, I like, uh, the people always tell me I like I like whiskey to hurt me, and I like <laughs> I like I like that burn that I get in the back of my throat uh, when I drink whiskey. So it's like uh, maybe it's because I've ruined my palate from drinking so much barrel strength. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I I do. As a buyer, are we able to uh, decipher when when a summer or a winter one is available? It's always written on the necker, um, so it, it's always oh, there's okay. always it always has the date and then what the temperature was like outside when we were doing when we bottled it. So every, every Necker should have the information of with the temperature outside, the data was bottled and then what batch it is. We, we, we definitely got the date and we got sunny. We didn't get a temperature. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant, like the, what it was like outside, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that kind of transparency though, because there yes. are not a lot of distilleries out there. They are so secretive about everything. And like, they might give you a mash bill and that's about it. Like, <laughs> I know you mentioned Four Roses is having five different uh, yeast strains and everything else, but they don't they don't put it on the bottle. They don't tell you what one it is, so you don't you don't necessarily know which one to follow. So like I've got three different Four Roses, and there are different barrels. Or two of them are different Rick houses, and can't remember what the other deciding factor is, but. You, you don't know what to follow. You don't know necessarily, well, if I like this one, will I like this one? You just have to experiment, which is yeah. fun. I love experimenting in whiskey, but if I'm trying to find something for a reliable staple bottle, you can't. And, yeah. You know. I think that's actually one of the things that I like, you know, so many people in this call have probably heard me ramble on about this, but I think the thing that I love about the line and now that I've had like three or four drams of each of them over since their arrival, um is or this this afternoon or this, <laughs> um is the fact that you know i love being able to have something on my shelf that i can serve to almost any palate um mm. and i think that's one of the things that you know whether it's because of your uh your we're only doing bourbon damn it kind of uh, kind of uh, mantra or whether it's simply the fact that the experimentation that you've done and the different permutations and variations that you've done over the years of your releases is between the specialty finishes, your small batch and your, your straight, you do really have something that could fit almost anyone's palate. Um, and I find that so, I do, I find it encouraging. It, it makes it very easy, um, you know, even as a, just a general consumer um, to be able to say to somebody, well, what, what do you like? Like, are you a peated scotch lover? Or do you like a Kentucky style bourbon? Uh, do you want to try something that's a little different? Like what works for you? And um, I think that's, that's something that you guys should be incredibly proud of, uh, of, uh, of what the work you've done. Well, you know, we, we, have, a, we have a saying that uh, we inherited our bourbon gene from my grandmother. And we say everyone has a bourbon gene at just so it might be more dormant than some than others. And so we always say, you know, take, you just had to find the right drink uh, and we'll, we'll find you the right bourbon to uh, turn your bourbon gene on and then you'll be ready to go. <laughs> Very cool. Well, definitely. I think for me, uh, yeah, I think the small batch was a nice opener, but it was really exciting when the rest of the stuff landed uh, to be able to. Uh... <laughs> you are right. It's yep. and uh, it's the 40, was it 40? 3.4 percent yeah 86.8 yeah yeah you're right but, uh, anyway owen I, I know that we're taking uh, some downtime for you between you before you get back into uh back into bourbon making tomorrow um love me love talking whiskey so it's always a great time but really really appreciate you popping on uh and chatting with the group this time as opposed to just hearing me ramble with you so uh, definitely uh, keep uh, definitely keep me in the loop as anything new comes uh, towards your palate um, and uh, maybe even the barbecue sauce one. We'll see what we can do. Um, well, I mean, I, I was talking to my dad today and 
So come March, I, I was telling that we have to allocate at least a case to you guys of the bottle and bond. So um, we'll uh, we'll get talking about that when it comes up. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, we had uh, we had our first limited release from one of our guys out west. Uh, and oh, cool. it was Kind of exciting for the group. We had the only four cases that hit Ontario. Um, nice. Uh, so uh, if you've uh, if you've got a couple cases, you can put aside for particularly for this market. Uh, once again, it'd be very cool to uh, to be able to say here something. Not only can you not get in Ontario, but you're just never <laughs> going to see up in Canada probably again. <laughs> so uh, that would be wonderful. But yeah. um, so unless there's any final questions, I'd say let's uh, let's let Owen uh, enjoy a bit of his night. And uh, thank you so much uh, for um, for not only coming on for tonight, but uh, as I said, helping me kickstart this crazy adventure. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Nice meeting you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Owen, for coming mm -hmm. on. And uh, if you like talking about whiskey, we are here every Thursday. So you're welcome to join. Yeah, whenever you want to pop on. Definitely man. have to. I, I've enjoyed this. This is this great. Yeah. yeah. Well, ever, uh, you're on on there. just keep a look on our Facebook page. Every week I throw up a Zoom link. So you're always welcome. It sounds good. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers, man. Have Thanks a great night. Cheers. Everyone. Cheers.